uh, U.S. Yeah. Census uh, Director staff turned in a, a document to uh, a ranking member, and you want to make a motion? Just to ask you know, consent to submit it to the record. Thanks. Without objection. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Uh, we're now moved to our second panel. Our first witness is Ms. Karen Naraski. Um, Naraski, uh, the Executive Director of the Asian American Justice Center, one of the nation's leading voices of advocating for the rights and interests of Asian uh, Americans. Uh, the second uh, witness is Mr. Arturo Vargas, the Executive Director of the National Association of Latino Elected uh, Officials, NALEO, a national organization of Latino policymakers and their supporters. Uh, let me see. Okay. Uh, the next one will be Ms. Uh, Helen uh, Hatapab Shamhan, Executive Director of the Arab American Institute of Foundation. Uh, thank you again for being here. And then we have the final panelist is Ms. Linda Smith, Executive Director of the National Association of American Child Care Resources and Referral Agencies. I want to thank all of y'all for appearing before this subcommittee. As you know, it is the policy of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee to swear uh, in all the witnesses before they testify, and I'd like to ask each of the witnesses to please stand and raise your right hand. You solemnly swear to tell the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative uh, each of you all will have five minutes to make an opening statement. Your complete written testimony will be included in the hearing record. The yellow light will indicate that it is time to sum up. The red light indicates that your time uh, has expired. And members, uh, we are going to stick to the five minutes. Uh, we're just going to go one round uh, for the courtesy of the witnesses. And of course, I think we have another panel afterwards. Uh, it is 9.06, so we're just going to go with, uh, and we'll be very strict on the time and just go with one line. So at this time, uh, Ms. Naraski, I would ask you to uh, proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we appreciate the invitation to the Asian American Justice Center to testify on this very critical issue. My name is Karen Narasaki, and I'm president of the Asian American Justice Center. We are a member of the Census Bureau's Advisory Committee for the 2010 Census, and as we did in 2000, AJC is leading a national census outreach campaign for Asian American Pacific Islanders. We're working with partners such as our affiliates uh, in LA, the Asian Pacific American Legal Center of Southern California, and in Chicago, the Asian American Institute in Illinois, and one of our community partners in New York, the Asian American Federation. Uh, we have directly funded and are coordinating efforts by 29 local community-based organizations in 21 states. Uh, and they include the Legal Center in LA, which is subgranting a statewide campaign, as well as three groups in Houston, OCA, BP, SOS, and one of the South Asian uh, organizations. Uh, we have also developed educational PSAs, brochures, and other translated materials, and have created a website that serves as a national clearinghouse for Census 2010 materials created for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in various languages, uh, and it's it's part of our campaign, Fill in Your Future, and you can find it at fillinyourfuture.org. We are also port uh, partnering with national civil rights organizations, such as the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights, the National Congress of American Indians, the NACP, and the uh, NALEO. Uh, Mr. Vargas will be testifying after me. As you know, Asian Americans have historically been undercounted. And because the community is two-thirds foreign-born and comprised of more than several dozen distinct ethnic groups and a multitude of cultures speaking many different languages, varying gener generationally, many challenges exist in counting this population. We're pleased that the Census Bureau has listened to our recommendations from the 2000 Census effort in building their 2010 Census Integrated Communications Campaign. Ethnic media is a very important tool in communicating to our community. In fact, three in four Asian Americans are reached through ethnic media. The Asian American media plan is significantly more inclusive than in 2000, with more languages covered and over 750 media outlets engaged. Media buys are being made nationally and in 53 additional local markets, covering 13 Asian languages and 17 Asian ethnic groups. And most importantly, this campaign does not have a one-size-fits-all generic Asian campaign, but it is one that is culturally sensitive for each targeted ethnic group. 
However, while there is improvement, there are still significant gaps. Too many restrictions on the access to the agencies working on the media campaign by community partners working with the Bureau have created frustration for a lot of our partners and has unfortunately bred some suspicion and animosity that we think could be prevented. This has led to negative media coverage uh, in some ethnic newspapers of Census 2010 at a time when the Bureau needs to be building trust in our communities. The national budgets allocated for our communities do not appear to be enough to cover several of the smaller but growing and harder to count Asian communities, such as the Indonesians, the Sri Lankans, Burmese, and isolated communities such as the Martin, uh, Montagnards Vietnamese. In addition, there's no Pacific Islander media campaign for the mainland. It is only focused on the islands. Many Pacific Islanders actually reside on the continental U.S and we run a high risk of missing them during the 2010 census. Finally, key opinion leaders often read the English language Asian media, and despite the increase in English language Asian media outlets, no resources seem to have been allocated at all to these media organizations. Of great concern also is the regional office uh, issues. There's a lack of coordination between the national and regional and local outreach and public relations efforts. The Bureau needs to ensure better coordination. It is important for them to work with their regional offices also to make sure that they are recruiting, hiring, and training employees with the best language and cultural skills needed to secure an accurate count. Another concern is the need for adequate hiring and training. Unfortunately, the AAPI partnership specialist qualities vary significantly across the regions, and not enough specialists have been hired to cover various communities. So for example, in Chicago, our affiliate there had to fight to get even one Asian uh, specific partnership specialist hired despite the growth in the population. To date, the regional office has only recruited one Chinese speaking uh, partnership specialist despite the huge diversity of the immigrant community uh, in Chicago. We also believe that the Census Bureau needs to act quickly to identify its questionnaire assistance centers and be counted sites. In 2000, they did it only a week before Census Day, and they must do a better job coordinating the advertising of where these sites are going to be, including the organization's leading community-based outreach efforts. Finally, the Census Bureau needs to make a, much more of a priority to ensure that dis deceptive mailings and internet scams that pretend to represent the Census Bureau and Census 2010 are not used to mislead, misinform, or otherwise swindle these particularly vulnerable communities. In conclusion, I look very much forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Representative Jackson Lee, uh, my fellow Angelino, Representative Waters, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you tonight to discuss this topic. First, we applaud the Census Bureau for recognizing the importance of using Spanish language media and commend the breadth of the paid media strategy, the investments in creating it, and for developing messages based on research and in consultation with key stakeholders. However, we have identified significant weaknesses in the Bureau's Latino communications plan. First, the Bureau's 2010 investment in to reach Latinos does not keep pace with inflation nor with population growth. In 2000, the Bureau spent $18.9 million on Latino outreach compared to $25.5 million in 2010. Had the Bureau merely accounted for inflation, the 2010 budget would have been $23.4 million. Accounting for more than half of the total U.S. population growth, the Latino population has increased by 33% since 2000. Had the Bureau increased its spending to account for both inflation and population growth, the 2010 Latino allocation would have been at least $31 million. Second, the Bureau's Latino strategy relies almost exclusively on Spanish language media and ignores the English-dominant Latino population. While Spanish language media are very effective in reaching Latinos who consume those media, many Latinos rely primarily on English language media. The Bureau investment in English language media is virtually non-existent. We are deeply concerned that English-dominant Latinos, many of whom live in hard-to-count communities, will not be reached effectively. Third, our media partners have informed us that the Bureau's investment is not enough for effective market penetration in many regions of the country. This is particularly a problem in non-traditional Latino population centers, such as the Deep South, the Mid-Atlantic, and the Midwest. 
A fourth weakness in the method is the methodology by which the Bureau used to decide local media buys, which allow for deeper market penetration and better message targeting. The Bureau developed six criteria to determine local Spanish language media buys. Those markets meeting at least four of the six criteria were selected. Now we commend the Census Bureau for including hard to count scores and mail return rates in the criteria. However, we do have concerns with the methodology by which these cr criteria are formulated. Where the Latino population is concentrated in hard to count areas, the use of market-wide HTC averages masks the presence of areas with low HTC scores. This measurement fails to accurately capture the hard to count score for many Latinos in a particular market. Similarly, the criterion which uses the average 2000 census form return rate, MRR, for a local market provides a skewed measure of the return rate among Latinos. We analyzed nine media markets that did not receive local television media purchases by isolating specific tracts with significant Latino populations and determined their average H HTC score and MRR. We also examined the Latino percentage within tracts and HTC scores above the national average and male response rates below the national average. This analysis presents a very different picture of the need for spot buys. Our analysis suggests that the Bureau did not make local spot buys in areas where its averaging methodology masks the presence of hard to count Latinos. Similarly, several markets with above average male response rates have Latino tracks where the rate is significantly lower than the national average. These markets include Boston, Austin, and Hartford, New Haven. The Bureau's HTC and male response criteria are compounded by population size criteria. This disproportionately affects markets with emerging Latino populations and communities which are relatively small. For example, the Laredo market, by all measures, is a hard to count Latino market, but it does not meet the 100,000 Latino household threshold criterion. Similarly, the Atlanta market has over 158,000 Latino households, many of them in hard to count census tracts, yet fails to meet the criterion of Latino households comprising at least 11% of all households in a particular market. Both of these markets were shut out of local media buys. So therefore, based on our analysis, we offer the policy policy recommendations. One, the Census Bureau must make a reasonable investment in paid advertising to reach English dominant Latinos, and it must significantly increase its spending on Spanish language media. Two, the Census Bureau must be more transparent with respect to criteria for targeting local buys. We believe the Bureau was overly vague with stakeholders about its strategy, making it difficult to provide any guidance. We urge the Bureau to, be, uh, to do better in its media buys during non-response follow-up. Third, the Census Bureau should report to Congress and stakeholders the strategies to reach Latinos in local markets that are difficult to count and do not receive local media buys. And fourth, the Census Bureau should carefully examine the inadequacies in its existing Spanish language local media buy criteria and make improvements when implementing non-response follow-up. Finally, there are two unrelated matters that warrant this subcommittee's attention. We recommend that Congress curtail third-party direct mail efforts that exploit the census. We also urge the Bureau to develop a paid media strategy to inform the public about what data are and are not collected in the census and how to identify authentic enumerators. There are recent uh, press reports that fake census takers are defrauding families who believe they are cooperating with the Bureau. These acts are repugnant, they undermine the census, and they must be stopped. Thank you again for this opportunity to share our views and, uh, on the 2010 Census Media Plan and, on hard to count communities, and we look forward to working with the Congress in partnership and the Bureau in ensuring a full census count in 2010. Thank you, Mr. Vargas. Uh, Ms. Uh, Semhan, if you can proceed with your testimony. Thank you for being Thank here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and distinguished members for this opportunity to share the perspectives of Arab Americans as you explore the issues that will affect communities who will be hard to count in 2010. By way of background, the Arab American Institute has over two decades of experience in working with the Census Bureau on ways to improve data collection and also questionnaire relevance to ethnic Americans and particularly to Arab Americans. It's no surprise, I don't think, to anyone that in the wake of September 11th, prejudice and fear about Arabs emerged in American popular and political culture and were also manifested in national security policies which were also based often based on profiling large segments of the Arab and Muslim populations based solely on their national origin or their religious affiliation. 
This political and security environment and climate play a significant role in how Arab Americans will view the 2010 census. The hard to count communities, in my view, fall into three, three categories. The traditionally hard to count. Those are immigrant families who have limited English proficiency, are not familiar as much with American uh, uh, processes, and, then, and might have come from countries where the government is not exactly a friend. The second category is the post 9-11 hard to count, and those are people who were willing to cooperate and support the census in the last time around, but, but now because of racial profiling in the wake of 9-11 are now more suspicious and less, li less likely to appreciate the protections that are afforded by the Census Bureau. The third area is what we call identity hard to count, and this is the, uh, relates to the race categories as defined by the Office of Management and Budget, and which are reflected on the 2010 census form. The undifferentiated uh, white and black race categories that do not allow for subgroup identification have caused confusion, alienation, and even anger within segments of the American population with origins in the Middle East and North Africa. Many first and second generation Arab Americans do not understand the race uh, distinctions that are codified by the OMB categories, and they have lived through experiences, both before and after 9-11, where they don't feel treated like, like the white majority population, and therefore they don't relate to the race categories. The great attention to pluralism and ethnic and racial diversity in American civic discourse has further added to this disconnect between race classification and our active participation in the promotion of racial justice, tolerance, the defense of civil liberties and the support for national security policies that do not punish immigrants or resort to racial po profiling. Given this context and the fact that ancestry data are no longer collected in the decennial census operation, activists and advocates have the dilemma of encouraging participation in a survey which does not appear to recognize who Arab Americans are. While advertising alone will not re reverse all of these challenges, we recognize and appreciate the serious effort that was made by the Bureau to reach Arab Americans and convince them of the safety and value of the census participation. The early decision to include in the paid advertising campaign emerging language communities like Arabic beyond the recognized race and ethnic minority groups was a positive step, even though the percentage of the overall budget was understandably small. The Census Bureau listened to the need to address concerns about privacy and confidentiality in the early phases of census planning and conducted focus groups to study opinions and attitudes of Arab Americans toward the census. Our participation in the advisory process permitted a dynamic interaction in the planning of the 2010 census communication strategy, a process that sought advice and feedback from the early stages of conceptualization and review of message and design, creative design. Efforts to reach the Arab American community extend well beyond the paid advertising campaign. A number of regional census offices, mo most notably Detroit, Philadelphia, New York, and Los Angeles, dedicated partnership resources to reach Arab communities in their areas. Detroit, in particular, led the way by arranging for translation of outreach materials into Arabic as early as last summer and by assigning a team of up to six partnership specialists to work with the Middle East community. Finally, in our capacity as a national partner, we are launching this week a Trusted Voices PSA campaign in Arabic language media. The same agency that was hired by the Census Bureau uh, for paid media ads offered to design and produce these ads on a pro bono basis. Our overall evaluation of the 2010 Census Integrated Communications Campaign is that it represents significant improvement over previous census efforts. We understand that adequate resources and time are perennial challenges to any census operation, and there's never enough of either. Uh, to assure a perfect process. We also understand that multiple and sometimes competing interests of diverse advisory bodies make the consultative process complex, demand extraordinary patience, and result in decisions that are bound to disappoint some stakeholders. We are stakeholders, however, and we are committed to work with the Bureau not only in the final weeks of the 2010 census, but in the months and years that follow the decennial operation. Our interests going forward include studying the extent to which the, some other race is used by respondents of Arab origin, and the results of the experimental panels to test alternative ways to measure race and ethnicity. And we look forward to new research into adding a question on ancestry in the, in the next census in 2020. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. At this time, our chair will recognize Ms. Smith for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for inviting me to testify tonight. My name is Linda Smith, and I am the executive director of the National Association of Child Care Resource and Referral Agencies, also known as NACRA. That makes it a little bit easier. 
Um, we are a nonprofit membership association, and we represent roughly 700 community-based child care resource and referral agencies around the country. These agencies in help ensure that families in 99.3 percent of all inhabited zip codes in the United States have access to high-quality, affordable child care. Every week in this country, over 11 million children are in the care of someone other than their parents under the age of, and these children are under the age of five. They are cared for by over 2.3 million child care providers. This group, as we know, is one of the most undercounted population in, in the census, and we have a serious interest in ensuring that these children get counted. So we see that child care can provide a vital link into, the, into this population during the 2010 census count. Our member agencies maintain a database of child care providers and programs and use it to link parents who are looking for care to child care programs in their communities. On an annual basis, we provide services to over 7 million parents. Here in Washington, NACRA operates Child Care Aware a national toll-free hotline and website designed to link child care or parents to child care providers in their local areas. We serve another million parents through this hotline. Beginning this week, we will be, we be, we will be posting information on the site about the 2010 census and will continue doing so throughout the, the period, and we will be encouraging our 700 members to do the same. Not only do we help parents find childcare, but we also train over half a million childcare workers every year. In addition, we collect information on the supply and demand for care and the cost of care in, the, in communities around this country. About 40% of our agencies administer childcare subsidies to low-income families on behalf of states. NACRA itself manages a fee assistance program for nearly 20,000 children of AmeriCorps and VISTA volunteers and military service personnel living off base, including National Guard and Reserve members currently deployed. Given our reach into the child care community, we have taken the lead in working with the Census Bureau to disseminate information about the importance of the 2010 Census to parents. We have an aggressive plan and much of our work, work will be focused on, li on families living in difficult to count areas. We are working with other national organizations such as the Children's Leadership Council, the National Head Start Association, the National Black, Black Child Development Institute, the National Indian Child Care Association, and La Raza. We will be publishing our materials both in English and in Spanish. You have already heard the statistics or, or are aware of the undercount of, young, of the young child population, and you have heard many of the reasons why that exists. We know firsthand that it's very diffi difficult to reach into this community. In general, we, can, we know that families with young children are highly mobile, and they do not have as many anchors in the community as, children, as families with children who are in public schools. But one thing that we do know, when they move, they need child care, and we can reach them during that process. We have a broad national network and are working with the Census Bureau to connect parents to their local child care programs. Our hope is to reach millions of families and ensure that our youngest children are well represented in the 2010 Census. We will specifically target our agencies located in the most hard to serve counties as um, submitted earlier. Because our programs depend on federal funds that are apportioned based on the subsidy data, they have a real interest in getting this right in their communities. Before I close, I would like to acknowledge the efforts of the Annie e. Casey Foundation for their work on this issue. It is through their efforts that NACRA has become involved in this work, and we are working closely with Annie e. Casey and the Census Bureau and our goal is to ensure that every child living in the United States is accu accurately counted in 2010. Again, thank you for inviting me to testify. Smith, uh, again, thank you very much for being here with us and, and again to all the uh, witnesses. Um, we now move on to the question period for the members and proceed under the five-minute rules. And members, we will, uh, I will stick as chair to the five-minute. Uh, I will go ahead and proceed now as the chair, and I just have one general question for all of y'all. 
You heard the uh, witnesses before. You heard how they were spending the money. Uh, there were questions about the contractors, and the, apparently the contractor didn't know how much money he was taking in, uh, and, and all of that because I want to see more of that money be spent on the field instead of up there for uh, for contracting purposes. What What are your general thoughts about this? Anybody, Mr. Vargas? Why don't we go ahead? Uh, thank you, sir, for that question. Um, I think one of the problems is that this field is very expensive, and the Bureau in many respects, with, you know, regardless of who would have been the contractor, would have had to spend top dollar to get this job done. I would say that the quality of some of the ads that have been pr produced are high-quality ads, but the amount of money that's actually being spent on getting the ads out into the market is where I think this falls short, because the rotation of the ads really is not sufficient to reach, at least in the Latino community's case, enough of a penetration in the markets to motivate people to act. Our media partners have told us that people need to hear the message at least seven times to understand what is happening, and they don't believe that the national coverage itself is sufficient to reach people seven times. And given the lack of local media buys in these emerging communities like Atlanta, like uh, Tampa, Orlando, like in Austin, like in Boston, like in Laredo, right. uh, I think we're at serious risk of people not getting the message enough to be motivated to act. Right. And I, I believe what, what you're saying for the hard to count places, the local advertising trusted voices would be more effective than this um, Golden Globes, um, Super Bowl, uh, on that. I, 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 would you agree that using some of that local media, whether it's Hispanic or African American, would work better than some of the money that they spent? Well, I, I think more local media would be very important, especially in emerging markets. I mean, we are particularly concerned at Naleo about the lack of local media buys targeting Latinos in the South which okay. we have seen hyper growth of Latino communities in the Carolinas, in Georgia, in Arkansas. Those are the communities that are going to rely exclusively on national media buys, which we have been told aren't sufficient to really motivate people to act. Okay, a question for all of y'all, and I don't know if y'all were stakeholders in this, uh, did they give you sufficient input uh, or an opportunity to get your input in the overall strategy? Uh, no, just from left to right. Uh, right. Well, AAJC is part of the Census Advisory 2010, so, uh, and we were actually part of a task force on media and advertising. The challenge, as you know, is a lot of the decisions get made many, many years mm -hmm. before that then limits what you can do going forward. So by the time that we were included, a lot of key decisions in terms of how much money would actually be available are already made. And I want to echo uh, what uh, Arturo said about the issue about local trusted media that you yourself is making. One of the biggest issues in our communities, particularly the Latino and the Asian community, is to overcome the issue of distrust of government. Mm -hmm. And it is those local trusted ethnic media who they trust for their you know, knowledge of what's going on in their communities that have the most influence in being able to overcome that particular distrust and an add on the Super Bowl just isn't going to do it for them. So that's a challenge. And then I just want to add on an earlier question about the ACS. My sister got the ACS questionnaire. Uh, she's college educated. We're fourth generation. We're not an immigrant population. And she herself was confused because she knows I work on the census. She called to yell at me about how long it was. Um, but also I, when I told her, well, that actually isn't the census. There's a second one that's coming in April. Mm -hmm. It was very confusing for her. And there does need to be, I think, much more uh, thought about how do you educate communities, how do you use some of the advertising to educate communities that there are, in fact, two census tools going out. And particularly in the minority communities, where it's hard enough to get them to answer one, you can imagine the challenge of trying to get them to answer two. Thank you. Yeah, if you want to go ahead and close up, because I want to stick to my five-minute rule. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Just uh, what, not only is Naleo a member of the Census Advisory Committee, but we also were a member of the Joint Advertising Advisory Review Panel, the JARP. And I want to commend the Bureau for establishing that review panel because back in April of last year, we were able to put the brakes on what we thought was an obsolete messaging campaign that Draft FCB had developed. 
we asked them to go back to the drawing board to come back with different ads, which we believe now are more appropriate for the kind of environment where the census is being conducted, including the recession. Now, what the Bureau did not do a, as good a job as is letting us know in advance where the media buyers are going to be and how much will be spent on media buys. Had we been a partner in that, like we were on the messaging, I think we could have been, uh, we could have been used better to advise the Bureau as to where we believe local media buys were more necessary. Can I respond to that too? We're an, obviously a nonprofit association and we're not receiving any funds to do the work that we're doing. And I have to say that I think there's been sort of an overlooking of the whole nonprofit community and mobilizing them around the census. If it hadn't been, as I said in my testimony for the Annie Casey Foundation and the work that I had done with them in the past, we would not have been brought into this. And I think, um, and now we are working with the Bureau on, on this, um, uh, on trying to get this count of children. But I will add that I work with another organization here in Washington that represents over 50 children's organizations, mm -hmm. all of them nonprofit, and none of them, to my knowledge, have been contacted to mobilize around the census. And I think it's a missed opportunity um, this gr these people represent groups that are highly trusted in their communities, and um, I think we could do a lot more to get the census out, and we would benefit from it. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I'll recognize the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Waters, for five minutes. Thank you very much. Just simply, um, based on everything that you have uh, seen and you understand about um, how this team is working, uh, for each of you, just quickly, could you support the idea that there should be more money put in local media buys? Uh, very definitely needs to be more money put in, in local media buys, particularly in the ethnic markets. Uh, one of the challenges is, uh, like with the Latino uh, advertising dollars, the Asian dollars went up a little bit. But if you adjust for inflation and the fact that you're trying to cover a population that has gone from 12 to 15 million and has exponentially more languages and diversity, it does not even begin to cover. So that would be both radio, newspaper, and television. Right. What about you, Mr. Vargas? Uh, yes, Representative Waters. But what we would recommend is that in those local media buys, that the media buys be more strategic and that more weight be given to hard to count rate scores and male response rate scores versus the size of a population. But I mean, the bottom line is, do you believe that we need to put more money into those local media buys? And we could help design uh, better and give advice about what they should be, but there should be more money uh, that, to do the yeah, job. There should be more money in local media buys, but I think it would be as important which local markets are selected for additional media buys. What about you? I agree with Arturo. I think it would be much. It would be very beneficial to have more money in the local media buys. It does. It does depend on where it's. We have a very small media in, in the Arabic language media to, to choose from, but um, and and of course we are the smallest percentage of the of the foreign language media buys as well. But I I, I think that more more local based media is a good idea. What about you, Ms. Smith? Um, I actually agree that, that that would be a good thing, but I also think that there's an opportunity to, through the earned media and the use, again, of the nonprofit community to get this word out. I mean, we, we have no budgets usually for media, and yet um, we work with the media a lot. And I think just g making the news that, for example, in the case of children under the age of five being undercounted, we can we can go out and get media in other so ways. So what you're basically saying, in addition to media as we know it, the print and electronic media, that the nonprofits have networks exactly. uh, by which they should uh, be supported to get the word out also. Exactly. Well, um, I thank you all, and uh, that's where I'm going with all of this. I really do think there needs to be more money to get to these populations and to be able to motivate and um, whatever the two phases are. I have a real appreciation for learning about Thomas Jefferson, but we really do have to get to the people who are going to fill out these forms and uh, get them back. So. If uh, we make this recommendation, we're going to be looking for you for support. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for your indulgence. Representative Jackson Lee. 
Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to follow the line of questioning that my colleague, and you've made the record, so let me just ask the question. Um, Ms. Uh, Narasaki, do you believe there should be an enhanced uh, uh, funding for um, media that outreaches to diverse, diverse groups, including print uh, and radio in particular? Yes, I do. It is something that we have been advocating for uh, over the last several, uh, several years. We've had to advocate each year for increased funding for the Asian American media, for the paid advertising, as well as the community outreach. Those things are really important. And for fear of the interpretation of our position being considered either self-serving or uh, to give another small business uh, some money, can you articulate how important these cultural entities are to our communities or to communities of color, meaning uh, their radio, print media, uh, that has, is a comfortable vehicle? Why are you suggesting that you need that increase in the media? What does that do in terms of helping eliminate or work against the undercount? Well, as you know, it actually helps uh, the American public generally because the more the more people you can get to respond to the mail initially, it saves in non-response follow-up. So actually, we're trying to advocate for something that would be an overall helpful benefit to the nation as a whole. The second thing is uh, ethnic local media understand what are the messages that are going to most uh, encourage people to respond, what's most important to their local communities, how to best phrase that, particularly in language, how to best communicate that, and they are the most trusted sources to get over the issue of uh, fear about confidentiality and government intrusiveness. That's the term that I'm going to use is the most trusted vehicle, which is a very important point in our mutual communities. Mr. Vargas, why don't you comment on, on the thrust of my questions? And you made a very important point about the broad brush on Latinos all going to Spanish speaking when there are any large numbers of Latino with their own concerns who are English speaking. Why don't you speak to the need for a media that is culturally relevant? Uh, thank you, Representative. Again, I think Spanish language media is very effective in reaching the population that consumes Spanish language media. And I'll res uh, refer to my written testimony where we cite research that where Spanish language media actually is able to increase, for example, voter turnout rates. But we also know that voter turnout rates are the lowest among native-born, English-speaking Latinos. And it is that segment of the population that we believe is also among the hardest to count. So ignoring vehicles, media vehicles, that use English language to read these populations, whether they be young people or people who are disaffected from society, I think is a real missed opportunity. And this is something we raised with the Bureau over a year ago that the lack of an English language media strategy could be a problem in the 2010 census. Um, you listened to the uh, listing that the uh, uh, previous witness gave uh, about how much money is being spent on national, uh, local. When the contract is 300 million, um, and I, my understanding is that the Census Bureau is not the ones that d deciphered or delineated or, or categorized how the monies would be spent. Would you make the argument that there should be um, a returning to the drawing board to reconsider or reconfigure those funding, that funding breakdown? With all due respect, Representative, I think we are already you know, at the past the 11th hour, uh, figuratively and literally tonight. Um, the census is weeks away, and these media buys have been made. I think the most effective thing to do now is to identify those local media markets that did not get local buys with significant rates of hard to count communities and low male response rates and do additional local media targeting in those communities. Well, I'm an optimist and I hear what you're saying about reconfiguration, but I do know that they haven't spent the total 300 million. So um, you're right, if they can't reconfigure, uh, if the buys are solid, um, I guess I'm optimistic enough to say that um, uh, some buys would be pulled down, but if they're, that is not uh, where they could go, then I would suggest that they dip into the 300 million. Let me quickly go to Ms. Um, Samhan and Ms. Smith. Ms. Ms. Samhan, you have a unique community, and uh, if you would comment on the need to pertain to that unique community and how you think the census is doing. 
Well, as I said in my testimony, I believe that uh, they're doing the best that they can with a relatively emerging market. This is, this is the smallest percentage of the overall um, special market uh, in, um, foreign language media that was that was allocated. Um, I expect that in the next census operation it will it will increase, but it was under eight hundred thousand dollars for three language groups. So it, it's a such a small drop in the bucket, and it was really for that reason that we realized that we needed to have a, a, a partnership effort that was. To, to basically complement the limited uh, funds that were available for these emerging language groups. So we did this PSA campaign, and, um, and we believe that actually there's a benefit to that as well because there's a way to get earned media and uh, media from non-government sources or media uh, about non-government sources supporting the census. So we think that this partnership with, with all of the nonprofit organizations that, are, uh, that represent our community speaking at the same time that the census is advertising is, is actually a good thing. So we need to improve our partnerships. Let me put yes. on the record uh, the total that I heard Ms. Uh, Innes speak to, $22 million for the broad minority community in terms of media out of $300 million. I guess I'm, uh, the, there was a list of numbers that were given. I'm just putting this on the record. Uh, my, to my question, she gave me a list of numbers. It was $22 million. This I is think that was for African, African American. American. No, I asked her to give me for all, so I think maybe. she did it for her agency. Okay, so $22 million, uh, across the board for that. All right, but I, that's still, let me just put on the record, $22 million for African American. I re, and Mr. Garcia, I guess, did not respond, and I'll get his in writing. Let me just quickly con conclude. Um, I know I want to get to Ms. Smith, but I, I need to get back to Ms. Narasaki. Um, give us an answer to what you said was indicting and vital disorganization of the regional offices, which many are seeing across America. What do we need to do as members of Congress to get right in the midst of that uh, problem? I think it's helpful for members of Congress to look, check into what kind of specialists have been hired in your district who are serving your district and to check and see whether you think it's reflecting the demography the, of the communities who actually make up your district and ask those questions. The um, while the census day is April 1, there's also non-response follow-up and that's gonna be very critical to have people who can knock on those doors and get the answers that they're going to need to get. The, the gentlewoman's time expired. Thank you. And I now recognize Mr. Quayo of Texas. Chairman, thank you. I've asked my questions already, so okay. I want to say thank you. Thank you very much. Let me have one final question for the panel. Uh, Ms. Smith, is the census in the schools program adequate uh, to count and involve the children of this, of this nation? I don't think I'm qualified actually to answer that question because we work mostly with the, the population of children that are preschool age children and they have they've not been targeted by any of these programs so I think you know if I were to make one comment to everything that's been said tonight I think we really have a serious issue at looking at young parents in this country and how do we access them it's the they they're new into all of this since the last census and we're obviously not getting to them no matter who they are um, uh, children under five are just not counted, and they're not targeted at with any sincerity right now in this count. Thank you for that response, and I will make inquiry with the Census Bureau about um, a comprehensive approach to involving uh, young people, since they are the most uh, frequently undercounted of all uh, segments of our population. Uh, panel two is dismissed, and we will call forward panel three. While panel three is coming forward, in the interest of time, I will um, also announce that um, Marcella Tapia and Hubert Johns or James uh, will not appear tonight um, for for various reasons. And also, we will include in the record the statements of Representative Hank Johnson as well as Representative Crowley of New York.
Uh, our final panel today uh, comprises those with media expertise on reaching those hard-to-count populations focused on by census efforts. Uh, first on our panel is Mr. Danny J. Bakewell. Mr. Bakewell is the chairman of the National Newspaper Publishers Association. The NNPA represents more than 200 black community newspapers from across the United States. Mr. Bakewell is the executive publisher of the Los Angeles Sentinel and owns WBOK radio station in New Orleans. He is the recipient of numerous awards, including the NAACP Image Award and the Congressional Black Caucus Adam Clayton Powell Award. Mr. Bakewell is a much, much sought after speaker, community organizer, and leader. And welcome to the committee. And next we have Mr. Mar Marcello, I'm, no, we don't have him, I'm sorry. Uh, we have Mr. James Winston, Executive Director and General Counsel of the National Association of Black Owned Broadcasters. Mr. Winston is a partner in the DC law firm of Reuben, Dirks, Harris, and Cook. He has been the executive director of NABOB since 1982. From 1978 to 80, Mr. Winston served as legal assistant to FCC Commissioner Robert Lee. Mr. Winston is a graduate of Harvard Law School and holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from the University of Pennsylvania, and welcome to the committee. Uh, next, we have Ms. Sandy Close, uh, executive director of New American Media. New American Media is the country's first and largest national collaboration and <coughs> advocate of 2,000 ethnic news organizations, founded by the nonprofit Pacific News Service in 1996. <coughs> NAM is headquartered in California. Ms. Close was ser has served as executive director of Pacific News Service since 1974. A graduate of UC Berkeley, Sandy was formerly China editor of the Far East Eastern Economic Review in Hong Kong and founder of the Oakland-based Flatlands newspaper. Uh, thank you for appearing before the subcommittee today. It is the policy of this committee to swear in all witnesses before they testify, and I'd like to ask each, each witness to please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you, and let the record, re you may be seated, and let the record reflect uh, that, that all witnesses are answered in the affirmative. Uh, each of you will have five minutes to make an opening statement, and your complete written testimony will be included in the hearing record. Of course, we have a lighting system, which will be operated as soon as my friend gets back. I think I can start it. Uh, anyway, uh, Mr. Bakewell, you are free to begin. Congressman Clay, uh, I'd like to thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to speak for you. Committee, it is really an honor to be here. Ms. Bakewell, may I ask you to pull the mic a little closer to you? Make sure it's on. There you go. Is that on? It's green. Yes, okay. it's on. Go ahead. <clears throat> Congressman Clay and members of the committee, I'd like to thank you for giving us the opportunity, giving me the opportunity to speak to you this evening. Uh, Congressman Clay, I want to give you a particular um, vote of confidence or an acknowledgement for the uh, leadership and vision that you have demonstrated in holding this, these hearings. Uh, they are much needed and hopefully at the end of these hearings you will know that there is much needed to be done. I also want to thank the members on the committee for the vigilant and direct questioning that you have posed to members of the census. You know, sometime when you come before Congress, you guys are so polite and you're so busy asking for the gentle lady and the gentle man and the gentle cousin. We get lost in terms of the substance of what it is we are trying to accomplish here. So I thank you very much for the directness of, uh, of your questioning. My time allowed it, I'd like to provide you with an enhanced version of my written testimony, which I have, been, which I have submitted. As chairman of the National Newspaper 
Publishers Association, which is the Black Press of America. I represent nearly 200 black newspapers and publishers throughout America. NNPA members reach more than 19 million African Americans and people of the Caribbean descent weekly. This year, NNPA represents, celebrates our 70th anniversary. Uh, we are not newcomers to this game. During 2010, we will also celebrate 183 years of tradition and service when the first black newspaper was founded, Freedom Journal. And it's appropriate that the echo of those who founded Freedom Journal says, we desire to plead our own case. And that is very much what we are here today talking about. Black communities throughout America, over the many years, the black press has established a legacy of trust built on honesty and accurately telling the stories of black America from a black perspective to black Americans about black Americans and other people of goodwill. The black press is the fiber that connects black communities, small, large, rural, urban throughout America. Our member newspapers publish in New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, Greensville, Durham, uh, Shreveport, Michigan, St. Louis, Oakland, Atlanta, Norfolk, Virginia, Washington, Baltimore, Texas, North Carolina, South Carolina, all across America. The black press is the black community's drumbeat, felt, heard, read in black households 52 weeks a year throughout the United States. The black press has been and continues to be the gatekeeper and collector of our historical archives and records of every political issue, civil rights struggle, and social justice movement, the challenges, triumphs of our people. The black press's ability to inform, advise, influence, and lead in the black community is unmatched, unchallenged, and unquestioned. The black community's trust and confidence in the black press was forged over many years. No medium represents the black community better. Today, I am here to testify on the importance of the 2010 census to black Americans throughout America and we want it to work. But I must tell you, there seems to be a lack of importance given to delivering the 2010 census into all black households throughout America, as evident by the census's initial offer to buy advertisement in only a small portion of black newspapers with a budget, they told you 1.7, it was 1.3 million to count 40 million black people. This is a difficult task under any circumstances, but with a budget of 1.3, you don't intend to count black people. As you are aware, uh, the second decade of un undercounting blacks will have a devastating impact on blacks living in the U.S. for many years to come. We were undercounted by 2%, and according to the statistics that I understand, 2% represents a about $180 million dollars in terms of how that is correlated. If we come up short, we again, for every 1%, 90, it will cost the government $90 million. So this is a clear case of being penny wise and pound foolish. We cannot let this happen. This is not a normal advertising campaign in which you can adjust your strategies. The census has about, as it's been said, about six weeks to go. What happens when we get the count wrong? What happens when it comes back and all the households are not responding? We are going to be put in a position where we have to forever hold our peace. If we allow this to happen, black Americans will receive reduced funding in education, reduced funding in health care, reduced resources from government. Black elected officials will be severely compromised and threatened and in many instances lost. We cannot afford that, and I know you understand that. Today I'm here to tell you that even though black newspapers have the trust and respect of the black community, and despite having the ability to deliver advertising message to the masses of black consumers and black people, the way we are going into the market is ineffective and must be altered now. Simply stated, and I've met with and talked to many of you, we need more money. The black press of America needs at least $10 million to have a consistent message in 200 black newspapers throughout America. There is no reason to cherry pick. Wherever black newspapers are, 
that's where black people are. We wouldn't operate if, 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 we, if those communities weren't there. Nobody reads our papers but black people. So if you want to communicate with black people, you have to communicate through us. There are other mediums, just like they talked about the Super Bowl, $2.5 million, fine. But don't expect to count us. Don't expect to get any residue. And you're talking about Thomas Jefferson. We, when we talk about Thomas Jefferson, we're talking about him and his mistress. We ain't talking about him being the head of the census. So, I mean, let's be real. These people up here were talking to you like if they were teaching a class at Georgetown University. They had no emotion. They just reading. They just talking. They just giddy up. And, and no, that's the same kind of message that they created to go in our community. It's not provocative. They want to get to our community. Nobody can de deliver a better message in Los Angeles than Maxine Waters. Why don't you put her on the front page? Put her in the advertising. Put, put Lacey Clay in, in advertising. Put Jackson Lee in the advertising. That's the kind of stuff that we need. We need names and people and bodies that are trusted in our community. Let me get back to this script. <clears throat> if we are to deliver, well, let me see, where was I? Oh, okay. You cannot say that you want to count all black people and then unveil a program to advertise in only 16 markets. That's where they started out. 16 markets. Didn't have Doris Ellis, didn't have Dr. Suggs, didn't have Amelia Ward. That's in places like Houston. That's in places like St. Louis. That's in places like Oakland, California. That's in places like North Carolina, South Carolina. No black people live there? What's the deal? How can you do that? How egregious is this? Now we're up to 55 markets, but we still don't have all 200 black newspapers. And we're going to, this is going to result in the greatest undercount in the history of black America. And you and we will suffer from that. And I beg you, as I have when I've met with you individually, not to let that happen. We cannot travel back down the road of having black Americans <clears throat> once again undercounted and underrepresented in 2010 U.S. Census. The message that we all count and need to be counted cannot be fully realized with an advertising campaign that reaches some African Americans. It must be geared to all African Americans. Black people do not live in only 16 markets in America. We live in America. Black people live in small, large cities, rural, urban, all over America. We must deliver the message we, where we live, where we pray, where we're educated, and where we're best informed. And the vehicle best to reach us continues to be black newspapers, black radio, and black churches. No question about it. If we are serious about securing an accurate count, we must implement a comprehensive outreach plan that requires placement and advertising of every black newspaper throughout America. It's not, if not, the 2010 census information is not going to be captured. And once again, blacks are going to be undercounted and underrepresented losing out on millions Mr. of Bakewell. dollars in our... Mr. Bakewell, thank you Can for I... your presentation. Um, uh, you went four minutes over and in, in the interest of the other witnesses, we're going to... And we'll, we'll let so. you... Maybe uh, during the question and answer period. In the question period, and answer period, you will be I able to, to be elaborate as even I more. Thank, thank you, you very thank you, much, Mr. Mr. Winston. Five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Clay. Congresswoman Waters, Congresswoman Quillar, Congresswoman Jackson Lee, uh, thank you all for staying to this late hour for this very important discussion. Uh, my name is James Winston, and I'm the Executive Director and General Counsel of the National Association of Black-Owned Broadcasters. I thank you for inviting me to testify. NABOB is the only trade association representing the 245 black-owned radio stations and 13 black-owned television stations around the United States. I wish to provide comments on three subjects today. First, the paid advertising program targeting African Americans got started significantly later than for other communities. Second, there are problems with choosing stations based solely on Arbitron audience ratings. Third, 
the allocation of census advertising dollars toward the African American communities should be increased. The ad campaign on general market stations began on January 1st. However, the campaign targeting the African American community got started much later. Some stations have been advised only within the last few days that they will be receiving census ad buys, and some which were previously advised that they would receive census ad buys have yet to be receiving them. Uh, Congresswoman Jackson Lee, you made the comment about the Houston Sun, and in questioning uh, Ms. Ennis from, uh, from Global Hue said that Houston Sun was on the ad buy, um, and obviously they have not conveyed that information to you, uh, which sounds exactly like the situation I had uh, just last week. Uh, Congresswoman Waters will appreciate this, KJLH in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, contacted me because they had not gotten a, Houston, a census buy, although they had been told they were, had one coming. Uh, when uh, we contacted the, the uh, Global Hue last week, uh, they said there was some paperwork mix-up, but of course KJLH was on the buy, and they began the buy just a couple of days ago. So in addition to the lack of money we have, we're not getting it. <laughs> They're not, they, you know, they, they are behind the curve in getting the money out. And the, and obviously, the, 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 the program is going to end at the same time for everybody. So if we started more than a month behind, we can't possibly get the messages out in time where they need to be going. So that's a problem that needs to be looked into as to what took so long to get started and why there are still stations that were told they're getting buys that have not gotten bought yet. Um, and worse than the timing issue, however, is the fact that in several markets, the African-American-owned stations have been completely overlooked. And all the Census Bureau ad buys have been placed with non-African-American-owned radio stations that target their programming to the African-American audiences. These ad buys have relied upon Arbitron audience data to choose these stations. However, a coalition of black and Hispanic broadcasters has demonstrated that Arbitron's new unaccredited measurement service, the Personal People Meter, discriminates against black and Hispanic audiences. Indeed, Chairman Towns of this committee held a hearing investigating Arbitron's PPM on December 2nd of last year. After receiving testimony from the representatives of the PPM coalition and Arbitron, Chairman Towns directed the parties to meet to resolve this ongoing controversy. The chairman warned the committee, warned Arbitron, that they would look at the, that, that the committee would look at legislation, legislative solution if the parties failed to do so. While the PPM coalition and Arbitron have met numerous times, no resolution of this problem has ach been achieved. Moreover, even if the Arbitron data were reliable, reliance solely on Arbitron data would completely ignore the ability of black owned stations to connect with their communities. It is this connection shared by both black owned radio stations and black owned newspapers, which has enabled these companies to survive for decades without Arbitron data and other data saying that we have large audiences. The connection between black owned radio and newspapers and their communities is not the one that can be measured and cataloged by Arbitron. It must be discerned from experience using those media to achieve a desired result, whether to sell a product or convey important information relevant to that community. That's how you decide that a station is relevant to the community. Local talk show hosts and air personalities can have influence in their communities far beyond the audience numbers generated by Arbitron. That would, Yet, in many markets, it appears that the Census Bureau advertising campaign has completely ignored this important fact. This leads me to my final point. The Census Bureau advertising budget needs to be revised to allocate more advertising dollars to black-owned media. As the Bureau is well aware, some of the principal problems affecting the undercount in African-American communities are distrust of government and a sense of disconnection from the government. Only a trusted voice in the local community can turn such attitudes around. Established black-owned broadcast stations and newspapers are those trusted voices. They need to have a much more prominent role in the Census Bureau's advertising budget than they have had so far. I urge the committee to examine this matter further and direct the Bureau to make a greater utilization of black-owned media. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. Thank you so much, Mr. Winston. Ms. Close, you may proceed.
Be sure the, the microphone is on. Bring it close. Thank you. As the Press final one. speaker, probably the oldest speaker in this room, a uh, speaker who just missed my airplane back to San Francisco, I want to echo what the last panel and my fellow panelists here said tonight to you and to wholeheartedly endorse the idea of expanding investment, especially during this last key post-response phase of the campaign, to those ethnic media embedded in their communities where the low response rate makes them absolutely essential targets. I had hoped to show you a photograph, and I don't know if Anthony stayed. He had kept the, uh, the photograph to put on the, on the um, screen, and maybe he's already left, because in some ways, a picture is worth a thousand words. Let me, uh, let me then go back to my text very quickly and come to the, come to the uh, most important example. Over the last year, New America Media organized 12 briefings for the U.S. Census for over 600 ethnic media practitioners. We started in New Orleans. We went second to Detroit. Then we went to Atlanta, Houston, uh, Chicago, Seattle, Phoenix. We literally canvassed ethnic media across the country. And you could cut their exuberance with a knife. For many of them, in Denver, for example, and in Houston, it was the first time they'd ever seen each other around a table as a collective media force. And at the table with the top census people. And I do salute A.J. Jackson and Maria Batos and Raul Cisneros and Steve Bruckner for trekking long distances to talk with them about the census. The difficulty is that they get the census. Juan Carlos Ramos in New Orleans in 2000, the undercount of Hispanics in that city prompted Coca-Cola to drop advertising in the Hispanic market in New Orleans. There is no question these media absolutely understand the importance of the census to their audiences. And from our first briefing until our last in Seattle, the anxiety and the uh, sense of, of uh, in a way, confusion over how they could get involved was very clear. They wanted transparency, and there was very little transparency. How do we get in line? Whom can we call? No one answers our emails. No one answers our phone calls. Above all, they expressed frustration over messaging that even while offered in 28 languages, was being created often far from their communities and by agencies they had very little input Excuse to. Excuse me, Ms. Close, the yes. photos up. Ah, there are the photographs. It's important that census advertising is being created in Vietnamese, said Thuy Vu of Saigon Radio in Houston but it's not Houston Vietnamese. Probably the best example came in Hoopa, California, where the American Indian uh, Hoopa and Klamath River tribes are served by two very important American Indian media. But take a look at the ads that the census firms sent the Hoopa, who have lived in redwood forests for 3,000 years. The first was of an American Indian against a cityscape. And the second was of plain Indians walking towards teepees. Both of them <laughs> they rejected, and we invested a very small amount of money that we raised from a foundation, letting them shape their own messages. And if we can see that message, you'll see the enormous difference. The, the third ad, which should be coming up right now, was of Hoopa looking out over 
their uh, very isolated redwood forests and saying, if they don't count you, they'll say no one lives here and they'll take away our water rights. The idea that our ethnic media are the ones who have the knowledge of their communities and should be helping to shape the messages is what leads me and to my final point because I want to keep this very short. In the last phase, if there could be an SOS campaign, Save Our Services campaign, targeting media that were left out of the ad buy or like Joe Orozco of Hoopa Radio, felt that they could have done a far better job messaging. Like the San Bernardino Sun that was left out. Like the uh, Burmese newspaper uh, that has Burmese audiences in Phoenix, in Houston, and in Nashville. Like the Ethiopia here in Washington with over 100,000 audience left out. They know what the messages are that will really inspire and cut through the fear. And the idea would be invest in them much as we invest in a community-based organization. We don't have time for endless focus groups to shape these ads. We should let these media shape the messages to their communities. And let me tell you, as, as Freedom Journal put it, we wish to plead our own cause too long have others spoken for us. They will convey the message that resonates in their communities. I've listed in my testimony some of the dozens of emails from over 47% of the media that came to our briefings with the US Census but never received an ad buy. These folks did know how to apply they did get in line. They did spend a day to be with the census folks, and they are ready to go all out. Black media, Asian media, Hispanic media, Russian media, media that are really the unduplicatable audience trusted messenger. And I hope that in this last phase of the campaign, we can maximize those dollars by giving them a leadership role to shape the messages for their communities. In doing that, you will reach 60 million ethnic adults who now rely on ethnic media. Ethnic media is the only sector whose audience has grown by 16%. In conclusion, it's also the media that when asked, what are your primary goals? 68% respond by saying service to the community. Only a third put making a profit as their goal. This is a resource we can't afford to lose as media meltdowns across the country. Your capacity to govern requires communicating with the governed. These are the media that are our intermediary that are just totally ready to to get involved, to be at this table, and they've sent the messages to you through us, which are excerpted in the testimony I've, I've left with you. Thank, thank you very you much. Thank you for that, uh, that testimony and what you've left this committee. Uh, it will certainly guide us in, in our advocacy for uh, ethnic, so-called ethnic audiences. Uh, let me recognize the gentlewoman from California first. Thank you very much, finally. Mr. Chairman. Let me again thank you for uh, holding this hearing. This is very much needed. Um, I think that we have uh, gathered enough information here this evening uh, to move and to get active to make sure that this so-called second phase or whatever they call it uh, is done uh, correctly, uh, that more money is uh, put into this advertising budget, more opportunities to shape the message from the local communities, as you are describing, you're right, it's SOS. I agree with you 1,000%. Uh, let me just say before I ask each of you 
if you if you you agree that there's got to be more money, you mentioned about ten million dollars maybe for the African American press, uh, and if we look at all of the the groups, we're probably talking about a total of at least somewhere between thirty and fifty million dollars more that's needed to cover uh, everything. Um, Danny Bakewell, um, may I ask you if, in fact, you advised uh, the census team that they should extract from you uh, free press in order to uh, get more money uh, in, in the media buy from um, the census team? Did they suggest that in some way? What happened with that conversation? Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. I have submitted a letter. Let me sure your mic's on. So yeah, we can it is. I submitted, I gave you a copy of a letter, yes. um, one to, uh, that I sent to Global U responding to that request, and then another letter, which is a follow-up, that identified specifically, and I want to read it into the record. <clears throat> what we said to them, they, they were talking about this issue of value added. We said you should ask, underline the word ask, all of the black newspapers who are committed to the census and committed to making sure that black people understand the importance of the census. Ask them to run articles, which we've been doing already, and ask them to run editorials, reinforcing how important the census is. They took the language that we gave them, which was to ask all of the newspapers, and this is what they wrote. In lieu, this is very specific, Congresswoman, because you asked this woman and she did not respond to this at all. As a matter of fact, this letter is, is, is directed to her and it starts off, I read your email in response to my letter to Mr. Coleman and once again, you got it wrong. What they said is, in lieu of free ad space in all paper, all papers must, underline the word, must agree to running six articles, preferably during the hiatus week about the census 2010, <laughs> as well as two editorials. If papers does not agree to the added value stipulation, buy will be canceled immediately. You, see, you hear this? You hear this? That was in the order, the insertion order that they sent to the papers. What and is the date of that? Well, the letter that I sent to her was on January 15th. And I want the record to reflect. I, some members have told me that they went to, they confronted members of the census about this, and they said, I apologize. I have never apologized nor do I intend to apologize, nor would I ever apologize about anything that I have said regarding to the census's inability to respond to the black community and the black media in terms of allocating the appropriate amount of resources and having the political will. You have the political will, but they are refusing to carry out your political will by, by putting the appropriate resources next to it. So to answer your question, that was, and I apologize, Mr. Chairman, for being out of order. I'm a little, <clears throat> a little uh, aggravated. Look, but the point was, I realize was, that you are very emotional. I'm about very this passionate issue about this. You see it, the time slipping away yeah. from us yes. as a nation. Yes, absolutely. I understand that. And this, this is this newspaper issue is my lane, and I'm staying in it. And that was just an outright lie. I don't even understand how she could say that. Well, let me just say, if I may, um, reclaiming my time, Mr. Chairman, that they were under oath uh, when I asked the question. I tried to probe it in the length of time that we had, and I think that we were misled. So, Mr. Chairman, I will consult with you, but I think I'm on the verge of asking for an investigation. First of all, it's discriminatory. Uh, Absolutely. And it appears that uh, the African-American newspapers are being told uh, that they must give uh, free space and uh, editorials, uh, or they will not get money. Now, they have retracted that, in all, in all fairness. After my letter and after my confrontation with Ms. Ennis, Mr. Coleman, who I never heard from, uh, and Mr., uh, uh, what's his name, ja ja what's his name, Jarvis? Jost. Jost. Um, he, he, he did, uh, they, they rescinded that. 
because many we were about to hire a lawyer to sue them right. on the basis of freedom, uh, our freedom of, of uh, you know, the, the right freedom of, freedom of information, you know? Right. I mean, it, it was ridiculous. Well, you you're know, absolutely freedom, correct. And, um, First Amendment rights. If it, has, if it has been rescinded and it's not been requested now, that will um, certainly uh, cause me not to uh, pursue an investigation in this matter. If there's one thing I can't stand, it is gross unfairness. I well, just will not tolerate it. Well, the that. fact that they did it, though, the fact that they did it, they don't do it, with, they didn't do that with the, you asked the question, how was that in relationship to the white press? They probably asked, asked for added value for all of the media. That's, that's sort of common in the industry. But to mandate and to say that you are going to be penalized punitively and we're going to take your advertising, that is reflective of the attitude and the mentality that they have when it comes to dealing with the black press and, and the black media. And thank you for that. And Representative Waters, we yes. will review the testimony. And if we see uh, discrepancy, we will turn over to the investigative okay, Chairman, arm of this committee. Thank you so much. And in wrapping up, I just want to make sure uh, that if you decide to move forward to ask for a supplemental appropriation or more money, whether or not these people who are uh, here testifying tonight will be supportive of that. Would you support um, absolutely. absolutely increased amount of money to uh, go yeah, to? I would, yes. I would say something further about the black press. Yes. Every city that we have gone to, and I'll give you an example of Houston and New Orleans, where we have built ethnic media networks, it has been the black media that have opened the door. They've been the gate openers. It isn't a question of black media being told to run these Th this material, the whole mindset is screwed up. The, the, it's a top-down mindset shaped by mainstream media advertising ideas. Mainstream media is melted down. It barely exists anymore. Right. And, you, and, and now you've got uh, ethnic media that's growing because people can't do it without it. They have the audience. And they are totally dedicated to this, but they're being ignored. They're not being asked what they would do to effectively message out. IW Group is probably doing the best job of trying to get input from local Asian media about what would work in their communities. But they've been largely restricted, as Karen said, to national advertising. What we've got to do, given the very limited time we've got left, is bring our media and trust them right. to be the messengers and help shape the messages, <laughs> and not just leave it to a top-down construct that has shown itself they're not even here. Why didn't they stay? Right. If I was getting $300 million, I'd damn well stay for this hearing. Mr. Chairman, Thank I, you I, very much. point Thank well you. made. I know the, the hour is late, but it really is important to ask the question, why won't they follow our recommendations? Black newspapers, as an example, as well as black radio, we couldn't exist in communities where we don't have the pulse, the heart, and souls of the community supporting us. I mean, the fact that they would, we would have tried and trusted mm -hmm. organs in the community, and we recommend to them <laughs> that they buy. I've had this conversation with, with Congresswoman Jackson Lee. We recommended Doris's paper, and they didn't take it. Eventually, after we badgered and we went back and we went back and had her call and I had a conversation, same is true with Congressman Clay. Why would that happen? How can you be committed to counting 40 million African Americans and come out with a program in 16 markets in America? It, it absolutely, I mean, befuddles the imagination. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate uh, the time. Thank you so much, Representative Water. Uh, Representative Jackson Lee. I can't thank the Chairman enough for his leadership Absolutely. and uh, vision on this issue. Uh, and, Mr. Chairman, uh, I would like to have uh, the members who are here, I don't want to speak for them, uh, but I know that if they're not on the committee, if we could have our staffs added to your email list so that we can be aware at your courtesy and invitation to come to these uh, upcoming hearings that I know that you're going to have. I, well, I you you so. certainly will uh, be notified, invited, and, and most welcome to attend. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I am going to ask for an investigation, and, I, and since we are in this committee, uh, I am going to make it official, and that will be up to you and your staff to assess. Um, because I made the point on the record 
that the census contracts were rendered in the previous administration in 2007, there is an instructive point that I would like to make. I know timing is everything, uh, but I would uh, prefer contracts not being made by uh, lame duck administrations, number one, but number two, because these contracts then disperse the 300 million, so in essence, I cannot go to Director Gross and ask for an accounting then I would like to have an investigation as to the utilization of the $300 million. And I think Congressman Waters asked it, but I would like it to be in the form of an investigation. How were those dollars used? And the previous panel, a witness said he believes that the cow is out of the barn. I don't know that. I'm confused. Do I have $300 million left or a portion thereof? Do I have to have a supplemental or can I go back in and reconfigure the buys? I don't know that. I'm not a media buy person. I happen to think that you do have the opportunity to reconfigure uh, some of the buys or some of the prioritizations. For example, uh, I believe that the genius of the people sitting before us is, is, is stellar. I believe that Vince Young in Houston, Texas, that won the Rose Bowl, could be on an advertisement in the local papers and got more young people running to be in the census than I can have any national star, no disrespect to them or actor or whoever it is, is going to charge me $1,000 an hour. I think the local restaurant person that the black newspaper or the Latino newspaper or the Asian newspaper or the Native American newspaper could put in or the chief in the, in the tribe. And uh, represent um, Jackson Lee, uh, not to cut you off, but we will give you a full accounting right. of those three hundred million and right. Representative Quayar has brought up some very valid issue about the expenditures being made and so have you. So and thank I think and I did not let you answer, so let me just say that I'm asking for an investigation and the chairman has said that you will you will do so. I'm so sorry. So I, I do believe and, and the reason why I'm going on, on that point is because uh, if we look at whether there's production costs and the production cost is ninety percent then I would say to Mr. Winston, I know you could get people interviewed on your stations that would have people running to be registered, uh, to, to be part of the census, as opposed to some production media that comes and you have to play. So let me ask this question, uh, Mr. Uh, Bakewell. Um, you, you're saying you have how many, 200? Uh, yeah, 200 black publishers, right. All right. Let, let me do this before I do it. Mr. Chairman, can I put Mr. Uh, Blakewell's, excuse me, Mr. Bakewell's January 13, 2010, it may be already in it, ask unanimous consent to put in the record. Without objection. To, to Mr. Coleman and then, and, the, and then his January 15, uh, 2010 letter to Mr. Uh, Ms. Ennis, I believe. Without it, objection, so on. Thank you. I have a document here that indicates a list of local black newspapers, and they go up to 100 and 52, and you said there were 200. Now, is this, a, is this something that you say have been fixed, or, or what is this I'm looking at? Well, well, I don't know what you're looking at. Uh, as far as we know, that all of our newspapers, in spite of the fact that we recommended all of them, they are not all on the buy. We had some that was just put on the buy today. And one of the things that you have to be mindful of is that when you get put on the buy, what does that mean? What, it, what they have done is that instead of all of the newspapers running advertising consistently, like we, we recommended that you start in January, you take a full page ad out, and you run that every week consistently, messaging, making sure you have the right you know, kind of, of layout. They, they, they ran, first of all, it didn't start in January. It didn't start until February. And it started for, uh, they gave some newspapers a six week run or a four week run one full page ad, one half page ad, two quarter page ads, then you stop, and then yeah. another, but, yes? I'm, Ms. Bakewell, I want to get on the record now. How many do you think, to your knowledge, is getting ads of your, of your membership of 200? Of, of, of our membership of 200, I don't think we're past 125. Okay. I don't know where this came from, but these, that's why this is part of the investigation. They list 152, so you're uh, saying I, that maybe that's inaccurate to your knowledge. To, to my knowledge, we have not been confirmed that those are all our newspapers. There may, there may be some papers that they're selecting who are not members of it. Will the gentleman yeah. yield for a moment with yeah. the lady? Uh, uh, the uh, uh, Congresswoman, I don't know what this mm -hmm. represents, yeah. but there's one named newspaper that's listed 18 times in 18 different cities. Yes, that's rollout. Yep. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. I want to tell you question. something is wrong here. I've asked for an investigation. And so 
um, this really does have to be looked at because, um, you know, I, I, it's just so unusual. Uh, it is not uh, something that most of us are aware of, and most of us are aware of um, the African American newspaper population all over the, the country. So when she says it's 152, and 18 of them are some newspaper that's supposed to be in 18 cities, that really does have to be critiqued and looked at. I don't. No, we will, we will ask, the committee will ask for a full accounting of the, the buy for 18 for, for, the, for the rolling out uh, if, of if publication. You, if there were any way to also include the, the Afro-Caribbean media, like the Ethiopian, one of the, the draft FCB person mentioned Somali, but to our knowledge, the Somali media of Minneapolis and the Ethiopian media but more, even more worrisome, why would San Bernardino, Riverside, one of the poorest and fastest growing region in our state, left out both Spanish language radio and the San Bernardino Sun? That's one of the oldest black newspapers in the state. Yeah, I know this is not my area, and it's, it's Winston's area, but I would tell you one of the things that I went over today, just in terms of talking about how, because we're all focusing on how do we get this done. We're really not trying to find reasons not to do this. We're trying to consolidate to say, how do we make, the, make this a success? In terms of black radio, they, are, they have told them to go into the markets and go into the top 20 markets and take the, the top two rated stations for those markets. Those are probably black programmed, but not black owned stations. That does not mean that the black owned stations are not reaching both with depth and reach the community. But they're just, they're just not focused on us in a way that is representative and realistic. Representative but Jackson Lee, would you if, conclude your If I might, your my staff has informed me that this list that I'm holding my hand, 152, came from the census, U.S. Census, and maybe we can explore this. Mr. Chairman, I'm gonna ask unanimous consent to add this to the record, it is not labeled. It says list of local black newspapers receiving 2010 census advertisement. So uh, maybe we can have an, a, a review of what this is because it is in conflict with Mr. Bakewell. I want to move very quickly to Mr. Winston uh, just to Without follow, objection. Up, follow up. Th and thank you. To follow up on this uh, question or this point that Mr. Bakewell's made, and I was going to that very point. It would be helpful if you could submit from your perspective or your list to this committee what stations you know uh, to be getting uh, out of your organization to be getting uh, advertisement. You say you have how many stations, Mr. There are 245. I'm sorry. 245 radio stations. Do you have knowledge? 13, 13 television stations. Thir do you have knowledge that the 245 and the 13 are getting advertisement? Uh, I know that many of them are not. I do not have an exact count, okay. but, I, but I, I have had uh, a number of, of stations contacted me saying that they were, they, that they, they either have not heard from the Census Bureau at all, or they've been promised advertising that was, that, that has never arrived. Uh, and I've, I've seen uh, in my testimony, I, I mentioned exactly what Mr. Bakewell was talking about a minute ago, about their, their targeting uh, stations based upon Arbitron ratings. So they're, so they're <coughs> taking the, 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 the black targeted stations, which may have nothing to do with black ownership and have no connection to the black community. Then I would ask you if you would do your own research. Maybe you, you all have the resources, but you got 245 and 13 television. Right. I'd appreciate it if you, could, if you could give us that report. Secondarily, I would ask, for example, to note whether or not, and I use these only as examples, so I don't want the other universities to raise up their voices, but I use them as examples. WHUR, I'm wondering whether they considered university-based um, stations, KTSU, Texas Southern University. I say that to say that's an odd component of our communities. Do they know that that is, however, a very important part of our communities? Uh, and they're PBS, some of them, of course, but the point is they reach a population that we want to be counted. Would you check that for me, please? Sure, and WHUR is actually a commercial station. It is one of the NABOB member stations. So I'll be happy to look into that for you as well. Uh, and I hope that you, that you will also ask the Census Bureau for their, for their record on what they say is the, the black target stations and the black owned stations that they claim to have reached. And that's a very good point. I will just close, Mr. Chairman, by saying, Ms. Close, you, you've been very art articulate. I just want this question to ask. 
Uh, do you believe that it would be more effective to utilize local personalities and local focus and local content that would actually pierce and penetrate the neighborhoods throughout America that listen to localized programming and media? Mr. Bakewell? Absolutely. Mr. Winston? Absolutely. And Ms. Close? Absolutely. I yield back, Mr. Thank Chairman. you so much, Ms. Jackson Lee, and thank, thank you for your participation in the hearing. Let me, let me close out by, by asking uh, one question each of you, and I'll start with Ms. Close. Um, discuss for us, after seeing uh, the, <laughs> the initial uh, photos and ads, discuss for us the importance of specialized ethnic media outlets and motivating the hard to count population and speak to the necessity of recognizing cultural sensitivities in crafting a message. Uh, and, and you can bet that they are monitoring these hearings. So I want to hear it from you, someone that's in the field. When I was in Hoopa, which is seven and a half miles, uh, hours drive from San Francisco, very isolated part of the state. The bumper stickers on the cars said, think you can trust government? Ask an Indian. The uh, people who run the Two Rivers Tribune, and I mention the Indian only now because we haven't really heard from the American Indian. Uh, the Two Rivers Tribune publisher said um, that most of the advertising to reach American Indians was going into billboards and that most people in their community don't really go on the freeways. And in any case, the Redwood Highway doesn't have billboards. And then they showed me those ads, the TP ads, and they said they were too offended to run them. And so we said, well, if we give you $2,000, Will you come up with your own? I mean, this is what is so ridiculous to, in, in, to imply that black media need to be told what to run and what to editorialize. These media are chomping at the bit to develop their own messaging. And then they came up with that wonderful, you know, if you want to save your water rights, be counted. Yes. And let me also ask Mr. Winston, how do past census bias compare with the current effort uh, in terms of your membership participating in media by the same experience or different or? Uh, I was told that in actual dollars, the numbers that have come down so far this year are lower than the 2000 census. That's right. Uh, That's and, right. Uh, and obviously you've got 10 years of inflation to add into those lower dollars. So it's, so it, it's significantly less in terms of what's happened. Uh, and um, I don't know uh, if that's in part, as I said, there are people who've been promised dollars that they haven't even seen yet. So I think part of it is, is failure of execution and, uh, and also a question of, of, the, of the limited budget. Now, Mr. Bakewell, same question. Uh, How does that compare with 2000? I don't know specifically because I was not in this position as chair of the I NMPA, uh, but I can tell you many of the members have said to me that last time they got more money and the buys were more consistent. And that's what we have been fighting for, as you, as you well know. Let me, let me oh, did you have something to add? Uh, the contract was purchased under another, not purchased, but uh, structured under another administration that we had a lot of input at that time. I remember, I don't know if uh, Congresswoman, if, if you may yield, Mr. Chairman, I don't, I don't remember Congresswoman Maxine Waters, but I think we, were, we had come together uh, and really had an impact before they went out with the structure that they used. Even though we had undercounts, I remember specifically having outreach through congressional offices yeah, that made more. much more, that made a difference. Mr. Chairman, if I could. Yeah. Uh, I, I, uh, thank you for yielding. Thank you. Congressman Waters, you asked a question, and I'm not sure this is the specific answer, but I think it is. You asked the guy who was heading up, who, who, who was the head of the agency who got all the money, the 300 and some million dollars about RFPs. I think what he was sort of being very delicate about is that they put together a team 
And the RFP that they're talking about was that he submitted the, the master agency an RFP for that one contract. All of those individual 12 agencies that he had did not submit an RFP to him. He selected them, and the RFP which he was telling you about was the one RFP that they submitted to the census. So you were right on, on point and on track in terms of there was a pre-selection of the people that he decided he wanted to have on his team. Let me, let me close out this hearing and, and first thank all of the participants uh, in this hearing. Uh, I believe it, it, it was exhaustive. I, I believe it was eye-opening. Uh, and, and, and I thank you for understanding uh, the, 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 the time frame that we conducted the, this hearing in. Ms. Close, I'm sorry about you missing your plane. And was, sorry about you all being inconvenienced in this way. It was, it was really unavoidable. Uh, interesting uh, issues have been raised this evening. Uh, this subcommittee will follow up and share what we find uh, with the participants of this committee, of, of, of this hearing, uh, the, the whole issue of, of ethnic media, uh, the entire issue of media bias, uh, and, and, and we will move far forward accordingly. And so let me thank you all. Mr. Chairman, uh, before hearing you end, I really have to thank you. We uh, really want to go on record as thanking you for the leadership. This is a most vital and important hearing. And again, your leadership and your vision for knowing and Im making this an imperative hearing has been extraordinary to, I believe, ultimately trying to get to the bottom and getting a successful 2010 census. Committee. Thank you, Mr. Bakewell. And we Mr. will Bakewell's comments. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mr. Wilson. And we will we will stay on this subject. And uh, I thank all of you. Hearing adjourned. Thank you, Mr. It's so good to meet you, and I'm so glad to have been.